and I think you know when you've spent time with players, right? Because when you have, you can tell by the way they let you coach them, and then you can tell when 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 your time coaching them's over, the relationship that you continue to have, right, with them, whether that's the years or two after, whether that's you know going to their wedding, getting the wedding announcement, and going to see them get married, whether that's getting the baby announcement, or just just an important things that happen in their life when they when they stay in touch, then you know you spent time with them, right, in the important parts of their life while they were in college. Welcome to the Jamodi Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamodi, just a matter of doing it. Today we are joined by the head men's basketball coach at the University of Texas at El Paso, Joe Golding. Coach Golding took over the UTEP program in 2021 and has led the Miners to two winning seasons in the last three years. This past year, UTEP won 18 games, which included runner-up honors at the Conference USA Championships. At his alma mater, Coach Golding performed a remarkable turnaround at ACU after helping the Wildcats transition from Division II to Division I. Over 10 seasons, he led the Wildcats to 158 wins, including 71 wins over the last three years. He led ACU to an upset win over third seed Texas in March Madness in 2021. Before we hear from Coach, Take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. How long does it feel like it takes you to go from, you know, a culture that really wasn't yours? You're you're coming in and and some of those players that are carryovers from the last. And then if you go through a couple of years, typically, what do you think, two, three years for it to start to feel like this is this is yours? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know, but you know, I never, I never, uh, golly, I got my collar. I just saw that. Sorry, you gotta help you're me good. out. You uh, <laughs> good. I, uh, I just thought it was a new cool thing you're doing. I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> my kid, my kids would probably like that. Say, Dad, yeah. look, uh, you know, you know what's funny? I've never taken another job before, right? So, first time I've ever done this, and I was probably a little bit naive thinking that the culture when I got on the plane from Abilene was just going to come here to, you know, yeah. To U- uh, and we would just carry it over. And I, I, you know, quickly had forgotten how long it took to build ACU, right. And the culture and, um, you know, how, how much blood, sweat and tears we put in there. And so I, I don't know, that's a great question. You know, the first year we had a group that stayed here at UTEP, you know, when I got the job, we had a core group that stayed and I had a ton of fun coaching them. And then, um, we got hit by the portal yeah. um, really hard. And then we didn't have an NIL set up here. So it was like both those things hit us at one time and we had to replace 10 kids. We had to sign nine guys in the spring. Um, so just, uh, you know, last year was just very difficult, you know, for lots of different reasons. And I think this year for the first time, you know, we kind of have our group, yeah. our team, our guys um, and, and kind of what we're, what we're wanting to build here, you know? And so uh, it's taken three, you know, let's take to your point, it's taken three years to kind of establish it and, and get it there. You know, we had, of course, a lot of momentum after year one, and then we yeah. lost it year two, and, and obviously got to get it back now. But, um, yeah, you know, I was probably naive. I'd just never done it before. I think that's a fair point. And I, I've had a lot of coaches kind of comment on the fact that instead of in years past where it, whether you're new to a place or not, you typically have some juniors and seniors that have been there for a long time that they're kind of they're, they're almost like torch bearers of the culture. They're going to teach it all the way through. And now it feels like for most places – you're you're starting from square one almost every year. Yeah, and I think that's been difficult too, right? Like at Alabama Christian yeah. with high school kids, you know, we developed them, we had relationships and um, you know, we recruited those kids for a year before they got to Abilene Christian. And, you know, now the, the whole business has changed, right? Now it's like you're recruiting guys in the portal for like one week or two weeks and you're bringing them on visits or, or uh, you know, the recruiting seems like it's happened really quick, you know, and yeah. Last year we took all, you know, like, what do you do, Matt? Do you go take all portal? Do you take JUCO? Do you take high school kids? How do you, uh, you know, I don't know the answer, you know, but I know this, this year we, we took some high school. I like coaching high school guys, you know, and I think there's some really good high school guys out there right now that aren't getting, you know, recruited, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, to the level, um, especially the ones that will wait until the spring. And so, uh, you know, we've been able to get some really good high school kids this year. Um, I think we're going to sign some good high school, you know, guys in the fall and um, just a mix, you know, um, and we yeah. sign a, you go and some portals and I I think that that model fits us better but I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes I mean I would imagine there's not a danger of going with a high school route but like you're excited about this kid you're thinking yeah for three or four years like we're really going to be able to do a lot build a lot with him but then there's this idea of well man after a year or two of kind of growing them and 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 working into pouring into them are they just going to be gone where you take an older kid that only has one or two years? At least, you know, 
that like it, it, I, golly coach no i'm with you i mean i lose a lot of <laughs> 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 i'll tell like, you uh, one like thing you go ahead time, yeah you spend time developing them right and then you play yeah. them when they're you know, like a lot of freshmen, maybe not are ready to play right away at this level of college basketball. It's, you know, the speed of the game, the physicality. They're playing against grown men now with the COVID year and yep. you know, 23, 24-year-old, you know, guys playing. And, and um, yeah, to your point, you develop them, right? And then you get them to where they're ready to play. And then the, they leave you or, or they, you know, yeah, they have a great year and they, and they want to go. And so, um, you know, it's difficult, man, but but we have to embrace it, Matt, you know. and That's and, right. You have to embrace it. Uh, it's the new. It's the new era of college. And if you don't, you're going to drown, right? That's so right. you can uh, sit around wishing that it was like how it used to be, but right. might not it's be there very long. Back, we're yeah. not going. Yeah, we're, we're not going back. So I guess just figuring it out. And, and then on the other side of it, man, you know, if if a kid has an opportunity to go play at that, I, you know, we had Sule Boom here, uh, Keontae Kennedy. Uh, you know, the year before Titus. Um, you know, all three of those guys graduated from Abilene Christian. They'd been here three years. I mean, sorry, graduated from UTEP. Uh, they'd been yeah. here for three years. Uh, they feel like they had done everything they could and they they were able to go to Xavier, Memphis and Northwestern. And, you know, they were able to make some money, um, you know, off, off an NIL and play at the highest level and prove themselves. So, you know, I, I so again, you know, you support some of, you know, when, when they're ready and they feel like that's the best opportunity we would like. We, we feel like we have a great product here at UTEP. Uh, you know, we, we really like our spot. We have a great fan base and, and um, you know, we, we would hope they would finish their career here. Uh, but obviously every situation is different. Yeah, but I think you nailed it. I think the, the, to me, the right approach seems – uh, hard to say that it's the same at a 5A Taps private school with 330 kids like I like I have. But I my approach to every year is I have no clue. Except, well, this is different. I have no clue who's coming in, but whoever is in the gym, I'm just going to do my very, very best for them for this one year. Like even at high school coach now, you feel like you, almost, you only have one year with kids. And so it but like you said before, that can make you frustrated, maybe even a little jaded where, well, I'm just going to hold back a little. I mean, I, I'm not going to give them my very, very best or everything if I don't know if they're really going to be with me for the long haul. Or you can just accept it. Like you said, I'm going to do my best for them. I'm going to love them, care for them. And if they choose to do something different, be behind them. But it's a hard, that's a hard decision to make. But it seems like the, I don't know, maybe the better one. Yeah, no, I agree. And at the end of the day, you know, you and I, you're going to coach kids the way we've always coached guys, right? And, and just embrace it and and get after it and coach the team that you have each year and then try to manage the roster the best you can in the in the spring. And it's, uh, Bill, I've learned if we if we have really good players, you know, we don't hand, we, we maybe need to quit the handshake line at the end of the game. And start, you know, walk yeah. next to him, walk next to him. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> our guys. But, that's uh, good. Yeah, you know, we're all learning, man. Like you said, and, and at times, man, the last year I, I had a lot of envy and jealousy, right? Of of like Dusty May and Grant and and Andy and those guys because you know they their their guys stayed and they had a, they, their culture. And I remember meeting with Dusty in the hallway in like early February. February, right and we talked and visited for like 15 minutes for the game and just said man I'm so jealous you know because they had it and, and so that's just what you're in search of right you're in search of finding that culture again and then once we get it which I think we're getting it here at UTEP just trying to protect it and and you know I, th I think uh having some guys back uh helps right we we had nine guys total back this year when you include our walk-ons and I think yeah you know, back in the day, that didn't sound that didn't sound like a lot, right? <laughs> you know, but that's by, a huge. Uh, that's that's <laughs> right. You know, and I think that's the big deal now is just having some guys back every year. Uh, if we can kind of protect that and, and continue to bring guys back, it, it helps save it. And, and you know, the portal does just ha get such a bad rap. And the moment you say a kid's going in there, uh, you know, and almost it, when I played, transferring wasn't really a positive thing. Like you typically right. weren't transferring because something's good happening to you <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but now with the portal it almost can't you have that stigma towards it but the truth is is there pro there probably are some good kids in there some great players that for whatever maybe their coach left and they just felt like this is the the thing and my, for so my point is is you you can still find great culture kids in there and but it, i think the like you like you had said about kind of being jealous or envious of those teams that had more people, I would I fight myself feeling looking at the portal as if all of them are neg. This is a negative thing, and all those kids are negative. You just gotta maybe be selective, find the right ones, but they're there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think to your point, man, that, that's a great point. Is the portals changed when you and I played, right? And, and when you transferred the stigma, you know, there's great kids going to the portal. You know, they have the opportunity now if they if they. Yeah. 
if they don't feel like they're in the right spot or playing, you like there's so many different things that come up, but they have the opportunity now to move once, right. If they want to, and, and, um, and, and better their situation, whether that's basketball or, or NIL or, or whatever it is. So yeah, there's plenty, and there, there's too many kids in the portal, right. There's, yeah. there, there's a lot in there. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we're hoping to build the type of program here that our guys will want to stay here. Right. And then they'll want to continue to play at UTEP and, and play for our play, play for us. And so, you know, that's what we're in search of. And I think if you build the right program and you're winning and uh, you know, we, we continue to build our NIL. Um, and then I think in time we'll be able to, that they won't want to leave. Right. Yeah. They'll stay here and be a part of it. And I think that's what Grant and Dusty and, you know, Andy, those guys had done uh, there at those places. And that's what we're in search of here. Coach, the last thing I wanted to talk about on this on this is about the portal. So let's get past that. And uh, and so, <laughs> I don't want to mess with that till the spring. Uh, yeah. So hey, I uh, want to thank you. Thank you again so much for giving up your time. Coach Tanner had nothing but awesome things to say about you, and I, I had a hoops talk with him. And so just thank you again. No, you got it. And actually, Coach Tanner was down here yesterday. He they did a staff retreat, and he brought his. Uh, staff to Abilene. So it was really, it was really good to see him and, and hang out and talk some basketball and obviously one of my best friends in the business and, and happy for what he's, he's doing there. The Jamoti podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. With the portal talk, I do think culture comes up quite a bit. In your opinion, how does culture drive performance of a team? Yeah, the longer I'm in here, you know, it's just been kind of coaching. Um, you know, when I first got into coaching, I tried to always be the other guys that I'd work for. Uh, and I know you always hear that. Uh, and they always say, don't be yourself. But it's just kind of yeah. what you got to go through as a coach, right? Um, we all do it, I think. And so um, as I navigated Abilene Christian, I started getting more to myself, uh, which was uh, more of a culture guy, right? Um, and and uh just really, really big on building relationships with these kids. I think, uh, you know, you can really coach these kids hard and you can get after them and you can develop kids and you can tell kids the truth, but you have to have that relationship piece, right? When yeah. I played, when the coach walked out with the whistle, they had their ultimate respect, right? Uh, we were scared to death and did whatever they, they told us <laughs> to do because he had the whistle, whoever that was, right? Whether it was uh, one of my dad's friends in Little League Baseball or it was a junior high coach or a high school coach, but uh, we're really big. We, we got really big on the relationship piece, right? At Abilene Christian and really built relationships. And then we were able to coach our guys. And, and then we uh, got a culture there of, of uh, you know, accountability of, of high character kids that uh, made the right decisions on and off the floor and played together, uh, played for each other. And, um, you know, I, I really thought, you know, a lot of college basketball games are won in the last four minutes. And I thought that relationship piece was really big, right? Mm. Because in the last four minutes, it meant something, right? And we had a timeout and they were looking around at their teammates. There was a real relationship there. And so, um, you know, the culture piece gets thrown around a ton. I don't really know what culture is, but, you know, like for us, it's just everyday relationships, building it with kids. Um, you know, it was different here. It's different here because, you know, at Abilene Christian, we had team, we had team chapel on Thursday. And then every day, Abilene Christian had chapel, right? So we knew we were going to see our team every day at 1050, right? Chapel mm -hmm. started at 11, you know, at 1050, to 11 10 or whatever we were going to see our guys right every day for 15 or 20 minutes well here at UTEP we have 30,000 students and they're spread out everywhere and, and so you know we've had to really adjust you know because I, I want to touch our guys I want to see them I, I want our I want them to be in there I just want to see them at practice right and so yeah. um I, I don't again I don't know what again with the culture you know but to me it's touch well, yeah standards those pillars yeah. of your program yeah. how you show up every day how you do things you're right. right. That word is just used too much, but we all have them. And to not be conscious of it, I think that's pretty dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you're trying to protect it at all, you know, at all costs. And, and here's what I've learned in coaching is, is, you know, when you have a good culture and you know, when you don't, right? Like, uh, you, you can figure it out uh, pretty quickly, right? And, and so you can tell by how your team hangs out, right? When, when they come over to the house, uh, you can tell how they, how they, 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 you know, they, they, the relationships that they're, they're building. Uh, you can tell if they're building them off the floor. You can tell them practice, uh, you know. Um, yeah. And so I, I just, you can tell in the locker room. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really, really obvious when you have that, you know, culture. And again, like I said, we're, we're fighting for it here at UTEP. And I think we're closer than we've ever been. Uh, this group has done a good job with that, and, and, and. And they're starting to feel a responsibility to that and, 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 and protecting that. And so, um, 
it's just, it, 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 you, again, you know, when you have it, you know, when you don't. And, uh, you know, we're, again, we're in search of it each and every day. That's an interesting point you made about the differences with ACU, you know, maybe a, a smaller university, but the mandatory chapels just almost giving you a team meeting every day right for yeah. you. So doing that a little bit of that work, UTEP, where it's all spread out, more more people, you have, you've had to be more intentional. What are some of those ways that you have made sure that you get to see your players, meet with them, get them together? Yeah, we just get them up here, right? We tell them they better get up here before practice. And, and you know, we have guys that love basketball this year, so that's been good. So in between classes, right, they come in here, they're in the gym, they're getting some individual work in and and I have an office that looks it has a window uh so I'm able to you know nice. bake on the window and get them up upstairs <laughs> and talk to them and when I get them up here we don't talk basketball most of the time right it's talking about their family their everyday life what they're doing how's class uh you know how's the dorm how's the apartment how you know and then how mom how dad how brother just just talk life right and not talk basketball um yeah there's times we'll get them up here right and talk basketball but um, and, then, and then we also have fun, Matt. Like, you know, there's days where it's all right, and we're going to do a few things, and then we're going to surprise them and play a wiffle ball, uh, right? And I don't even know if our guys know how to play wiffle ball, but, you nice. know, again, just having fun, right, and doing some things with them where they see you outside of the realm of a basketball coach, right, and just – and 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 just uh, – and and co coaching them up all the time right like they see you in a different light uh we have our guys over to our house a bunch i challenge my assistant coaches to get them over to their house uh see them in that limelight see them being a father right uh, around other kids and see them yeah. uh you know eat, eat, and eat dinner and spend time again it's just time right it's time you have to find ways to have time uh to, to spend with them to build a relationship and you know we'll do some things in, in the locker room that's not basketball related right we, we take a retreat every year matt we started doing this at abilene christian um i got it from coach beard um and the teams at, at, in lubbock he, he started doing it and we kind of piggybacked uh, off him and so we take a two-day retreat and you know it counts as two days of our practice but i don't care uh you know we get we turn our phones off we get away from basketball and we're fortunate here to have some mountains we didn't have any mountains uh in abilene we had to drive so <laughs> that's true i've drive, driven through abilene the there's no <laughs> you got an olive garden but there's no mountains yeah. <laughs> there's no deal, but uh <laughs> But we get away, Matt, you know, and we, um, we 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 do some really good stuff, right? Some team bonding stuff, and we do a lot of activities with them, and then we talk, and then we get in some pretty deep talks uh, with them. And, and so our guys get to know them, right, and really get to know them. Um, and then we do a sacrifice each year, right? So we, we do a huge bonfire, and we make a sacrifice uh, in front of the team of something that we're going to do that makes the group better, right? Not just ourselves better, uh, but our group better. And then we hold each other accountable to that sacrifice, uh, all year and then once the season's over we turn the page right and 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 move on but things like that right yeah Just to get, getting away from basketball spending time and i think the relationship piece but again time's the important thing coach the reoccurring word that you've said over and over again is time like you when you look back and you realize man maybe i wasn't as close to that team the standards the the that we had across the board weren't i didn't hold them to that though that level the culture wasn't as good. I would imagine it's most likely a lack of time that yeah. you had with them that they had together. So one of the somebody said, I can't remember who, but that culture is our number one job as coaches. I think so many times we focus on the schedule, the X's and O's, the skill work, all those things that are fun and we do love. But man, time with our players, I think you nailed it. No, I agree. And I, I think that's the, you know, that's the biggest thing is. Uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, when you've spent time with players, right, because when you have, you can tell by the way they let you coach them. And then you can tell when when, when your time coaching them is over the relationship that you continue to have right with them, whether that's, uh, you know, the years or two after, whether that's, going, you know, going to their wedding, getting the wedding announcement and going to see them get married, whether that's getting a baby announcement or just just an important things that happen in their life when they when they stay in touch, then, you know, you spent time with them right um, in, in the important parts of their life while they were in college. And so, yes, to your point, I think it's very, very obvious. You you said something earlier about you got a lot of guys who love basketball. And that kind of jumped out at me because I think a common misconception is that people that, that think of college level players, that, that they all love it, that they all just want to be in the gym all the time. And from my experience, probably your experience too, is playing and then obviously you coaching at that level for a long time. I was always blown away by there are some really talented guys that are good at this game. But did they love it? Did they just want to be in the gym all the time? I think that's a big distinction for high school players to understand that at that level, like loving it, uh, it's it's pretty important. 
yeah, you're always perf perfecting your craft, right? And and I tell our, our coaches in recruiting, I'll just take guys that like basketball, you know, just give them the best of like it, right? Uh, and then if you're fortunate to get a guy that loves it, uh, you know, that spends a ton of time in the gym, that just makes you, uh, obviously, they're, they're, they you know they're invested, right? They're, they're not only invested in themselves, uh, but they're also invested in you and the program, right? And and trying to get to, to better themselves. And we have a little saying in our program, Matt, like from uh, October to March, it's about UTEP, right? And it's about our team and it's about the development of our team. And we're doing whatever we can to, to win games, right? With, with, with amongst the pieces that we have from October to March. From March to October, it's about yourself, right? And, and how and how much can you improve yep. to change your role next October, right? And, and, and always trying to get things that we can, uh, again, perfect our craft, get, get better at the things that we're really good at, and then let's improve on the things that we're not good at during that time period. But to do that, you have to love basketball, right? If we're constantly having to get them up in the gym, I mean, during the off season, you only get four hours a week with them, right? So it's however you want to do it, you know, but but if it's an hour a day for four days, they're not going to get much, you know, I mean, they, they got to invest some time and, and they have to come back and do it on their own. And uh, if you're constantly, again, having to get them up here to do it or you're fighting them to get up here to do it, uh, it just becomes a hassle for you and a hassle for them. But the ones that you don't have to fight, right, to get in the gym that truly, truly love the game of basketball, truly love being in the gym, uh, you know, those are the ones that are fun to coach, right? And, and, yeah. and you, you know, they become your better players. They become your better leaders. Um, and again, the culture piece, uh, the more you have that, that are like that, uh, the more that more guys they bring to the gym with them, right? Because they yeah. start looking around the, the locker room and if t eight or nine of them are always in the gym and they're getting better and the other ones aren't, uh, they better Let's get use that peer pressure there. That, yeah, uh, yeah. That's yeah. the positive side of peer pressure. Absolutely. You know, it's peer pressure from players just by their everyday actions. And so, uh, you know, this group's been really good. It's been fun to, to look down there. You know, it's a group that, again, they love being in there and, uh, you know, they, they love to, to get in the gym and, and uh, <laughs> completely transparent. I was not that way. Right. Like I, I, I love to compete. Yeah. Uh, you know, back in the day, and and I I, I didn't necessarily love all the drill work, right? And then that's still the, today. That's still the case, right? Like, uh, there, there's guys that all summer they're not very good, right? Um, and, and in the fall, and then all of a sudden you start going five on five, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, uh, you know, and and but you got to encourage them during the drill work, right? There's other guys that are great in drills and great in playing. There's other guys that are really good in drill work and look good in individual. Then you play, right? But so there's yeah. all kinds of different kids and. Uh, to your point, whether you're a high school coach, junior high coach, college coach, we're all trying to motivate each kid the best way we can, um, you know, to, to, to again, uh, make our pieces to the to the puzzle the best they can be. Right. So uh, that that's coaching. Right. And that's finding different ways to, to, to motivate these guys. But I know this, the more they're in the gym, the better player they're going to become and the better players we can get them. Um, the better. No team, right. There's there's no yeah. secret to that, you know, it's just it's just finding the, the guys that want to get in there. I love that model that you talked about, the October through March being all about UTEP and then those other months being about their individual development. I feel like that's what we also need at the high school level, because like from October till maybe end of February, hopefully March for us, it is going to be about faith basketball. But then I've seen a lot and maybe when I was younger and a lot of coaches, as soon as our season is done. All right. Now it's faith faith basketball for next year. If I was a kid, I think, okay, at what point is it actually about me? Cause we, we, we ask them to be so selfless for six months, seven months, but there is this idea where there's really two tracks going right now. There's the team track and there's the individual track. And we still want them growing and moving along that. But in my opinion, the model you talked about gets them to maximize the team but then be growing and still grinding because that's what select ball is for. In my opinion is not, it's not about team time anymore. Right. And, and, and it happens, Matt, there's times in the season, right. Where we're to your point, you continue to develop during the, during the season, your role changes, right? Like yeah. there's guys in, in the season that, that your point get better and better and better. Uh, and, and their role gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right. Um, throughout the season. And um, so, yeah, roles can adjust during the season. We talk, we tell our guys that, right. Um, you know, roles can adjust, um, but but at the same time, where we're really trying to perfect their craft and the individual development piece is done from March to October, right? And we, we try to get, you know, we, we meet with them obviously after the season. And um, I guess the first thing we ask them is, are you coming back? But uh, with the boy, the yeah, portal, different, different order of questions now. But, but uh, you know, then after that, it's okay. These are the things you did really well. So let's continue to work on those a little bit. But these are things that we, we, we can see you improving on. And this is where your role could expand the following year, whether that's weight training, whether that's gaining weight, losing weight, whether that's uh, becoming a better perimeter shooter, whether that's putting the ball on the floor, 
Um, you know, whatever the case may be, let's spend time on that. Let's let's invest in that over the next six months uh, and, and and get better. I also think summer's a really good time to be creative and let guys get out of their their their, their box a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. you know, you come watch us practice and offense, uh, you know, some things in the summer. Uh, we might not be as precise as we want to be, but we're letting guys do some things we might not let, let them do in the season. But again, we're trying to let them grow right uh, in, in their role and in their craft and in their development. So. We were really, really big on the development piece at Adeline Christian. That, that's what we were, right? We, we got them as freshmen. They played behind really good juniors and seniors. Uh, and then by the time they were sophomores, their role was, you know, expanding. And, um, you know, by juniors and seniors, they were carrying the torch, right, for our team. And, the, and we just kept it coming. And we, we were – our staff, uh, I thought, did a tremendous job of developing those guys. And it's harder to develop now, Matt, right, because I think that's the biggest piece people don't talk about, Um is the development piece now, right? It's like, because if these guys are leaving and going, you know, to different places all the time, it's hard to develop them, right? And the, the, yeah. the development piece is done uh, in the spring or summer. And so it's just, it's become difficult, I think, to do that and, and harder to do that. And then, you know, let's 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 state the obvious, man, right? If, if you're really, you know, trying to develop hard in the spring and summer, they don't like it and they don't want to do that. Because it, it, yeah. Right? Yeah. It, 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 it's hard. It takes time and it takes work. And, um, if they don't want to do it, they just go somewhere else. Right. And so, uh, it, it to, to your point earlier. So, um, you know, I still think our staff here is doing a really good job. We have guys developing, we have guys that have been in our program two or three years now. And those are the guys that are, are obviously bought in, you know, to, to what we're doing here and that you, they're getting better and better. And I think they're going to have tremendous seasons this year. And, um, selfishly, I enjoy those, right. Those are the stories that I really like, right. I, yeah. I love the guys in our program roles expand and, and continue to get better and, uh, become really, really good players. Cause I know the time and work they put in coaches. The Jamoti podcast is powered by shoot 360. The future of basketball has arrived in Dallas, Fort Worth shoot 360 combines the latest sports technology with the fundamentals of basketball skill development. The result is a one of a kind video game, like basketball program designed to improve your shooting, dribbling, and passing. Visit Shoot360DFW.com to learn more and register for your free one-hour workout evaluation. Shoot360, the future of basketball is here. I used to think that, and maybe, again, we, you and I are close to the same ages, so I keep thinking, you know, back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but loyalty was such a big thing where, like, I felt like, like I was – so loyal to Baylor because I couldn't believe that they actually wanted me to be there. <laughs> you know, like they actually wanted me to play. Now I feel like loyalty can be such a huge asset for a player because as a coach, when so many are leaving, like if I was a college player today, I would try to get into a good, the best situation for me. And then I put my feet there and just try to re remain because most likely the dudes that might've been playing over me, they might not be there next year. And you and I both know, like what was the issue with red shirt guys back in the day, especially if they only had one year was in that one year that they red shirted and then came back. Was it really enough for them to learn the system, learn how to be coached to gel? And a lot of times I, I didn't think it was the loyalty coach to me seems like a way to get more now than ever before. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a terrific point. And, uh, you know, I think you have a lot more invested in a kid that's loyal to you because of the time, right, that you've spent to them. And 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 uh, I think that uh, th those kids are going to have success, right, uh, just because, again, you, you have the relationship piece and the time that you pin into a kid that's been loyal that plays for you for four years, uh, you know, that, that kid's going to have us. I, I would think his success rate, right, at that school yeah. would be you know, and be successful. But, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, it just doesn't happen anymore. Your loyalty now could be for six months, right? Um, you know, it could be for, you know, one season, one summer, one one season. Um, it could be for two years uh, with, with with guys now. So it's, that that's, um, again, that's the tricky part to it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%, you know, and um, I, I do think there's some still some kids that are loyal out there. I think there's kids that uh, will find the right spot. And then there's kids that leave, like I said, Matt, that it's not because they're disloyal, right? They, yeah. they, they feel, and uh, who am I honestly to hold them back from, you know, something that they feel like they, they need to do that the way our business is set up right now, they, they, they can do that once. Right. Um, you know, and so um, uh, again, I just, I just embrace it. I, I think one thing um, about the red shirt, and I think it's always been different. Um, you know, my brother-in-law, Sonny Dykes, he's a you know, football coach at TCU. And so Sonny and I always, we always talk about this because 
they redshirt freshmen almost all the time, right? Like this is very few – football has just yeah. always been that way, right? Like if there's not been a – it's a stigma associated with redshirting, right? It's kind of like what they do, right? You redshirt, you get bigger, you get stronger, and then you play, right? The following year. Um, and then in basketball, we've always had like this stigma to it, right? Like if you redshirt, it meant you weren't good enough. Or, yeah. Uh, and, and some of the, the best players we had at Abilene Christian, we redshirted, you know, and, and they developed. And uh, our big kid, Colton Cole, is a great example of it, right? And, uh, and, and so sometimes it's like, okay, you, you, if you're not going to play a lot as a freshman, yeah. Right. Um, why wouldn't you use that year for a fifth year when you're 22 years old and you're ready to play? So I'm trading five or 10 minutes, maybe as a freshman to playing 30 minutes as a fifth year senior, you know, and getting that year. And so I've never understood that stigma. Now, are there freshmen that are ready to play at our level? Yeah. You know, there's freshmen that come in and for whatever reason, they're, they're ready to play. They're physically mature enough. The speed of the game, they're caught up. Yeah. You know, what, what reason it might be, uh, they're ready to go. But, you know, to the freshmen that aren't ready. Uh, I've always never really understood that, right? Like, why wouldn't you on the fifth year get it on the back end and play more? Yeah, and to your point, I, just to clarify, I think I kind of sped over that too much. My my thought was, like, we at times had guys come in for – they only had one year left, so they were yeah. transferring. They had that red shirt, and then they only played for one more year. Yeah. And this was back yeah. in the day. Yeah. You and you, yeah. you had to sit out. They developed some kind of bad habits, but then was one year enough time for them to learn the system, learn the culture, to get back in the flow? That's where I saw, because I can remember, I'm not, I won't use any names, but players that I thought were older and way better than me coming back for that one year, but I had been in the system for was, two years was, and I could play over them. And I remember thinking like, how in the world am I playing? There's this idea that that could happen now. It's, even though it's not a red, sh- a red shirt, but guys coming in for one year or two, those younger players that have been around in the system, I feel like might have a leg up because you having trust in them and the time you've spent with them might even be able to help out or trump maybe the talent of an older guy that I think that's where my mind was going with that. Just horribly articulated on my part. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're hundred percent correct though. Right. I mean, I mean, you're, you're going to want to, you're going to trust and want to put a kill on the floor, right. That's been with you for two or three years that understands, you know, he knows the play calls backwards and forwards. He probably knows where all five guys are supposed to be. He probably knows what you're going to call before you even call it. Right. Like, uh, and defensively, obviously the way we play, he probably understands it inside and out. And, um, so yes, I think there's a, a, a lot of truth to, to, to your point, um, with, with, with the importance of, of guys that, that stay loyal, um, to a program and understand that program and the insides and outs and what's it's about. They're probably the leaders at that point, right. Of the program. Yeah. And you're probably going to play those kids. At the no high school, you would. I mean, you you yeah. would play those. Yeah. At the high school level, uh, style of play is something that's really interesting to talk about because for most of us that don't recruit, we who we have is is who we have, and maybe we have a style of play that we love, but does that really fit this team? And you might have to adjust from year to year. At the college level, the thought is that you can recruit the players that fit the style of play or the system that you love. I don't know if things have changed a little bit with how fluid things are now. So do you have a style of play that you just love to teach? This is who we are. And you find players for that, or are you going out getting the best available and we'll kind of adjust however we need to. And to your point, that's why I have so much respect to high school coaches, right? Because I was there, you know, I coached in high school for five years, I guess it was. Um, And where were you at? I was at South Garland high school as an assistant for Garland. No way. Now we, I was the head coach at Saxe high school in Garland when it started. So that's where I met my wife. Yeah. So she was a math teacher. And so we started Saxe uh, year one uh, there. Yeah. So what year were you at Saxe? Oh my gosh, man. Do you Uh, remember that? 47. It was, uh, graduated in 98 or 99. So two years South. So probably around 2004 or five. McKinney McKinney North and, and we, we both started at the same, same time. Coach Kraft and I, both, both, we played each other like fifteen times. We had nobody else to play. <laughs> I was at Name and Force with Jeff Clarkson yeah, yeah. in 0607. So probably missed you, probably missed, you. Yeah, missed like, you there. But yeah, and then with with Wes Watson at McKinney for five years. So Kraft, he's one of the best. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we would have no one to schedule. We'd try to schedule for like three months and then we'd just say, okay, what dates? I said, Coach, I got like 12 open dates. It's like, <laughs> I got 10. So we just <laughs> played it. But, uh, but to your point, like, yeah. I, that's why I have so much respect for, for high school coaches because you got to, you, you, each each year you might have a dip, like, you know, you, you, you know, I know at Faith you guys play fast, you know, and do it. But let's say you have a big kid, you know, that, that comes in and, and, yeah. And you want to, you know, what do you do for that kid, right? Like, like, you know, do you slow it down? And then the next year you don't have a big kid and, you know, you're smaller and you got five guards and you want to dribble drive motion, right? And yeah. so you're having to put that in in the summer and then the fall, and you know, with, with your group. And so I've always had so much respect uh, for that. I think us as college coaches, we can recruit to a certain system. Um, I think that does help us, right? So we can stay pretty consistent with with what we do or what we believe in. But I do think you have to adjust each year, right? And, uh you can't necessarily go out and recruit it every time, right? Uh, you might have better bigs in your in your on your team one year that is developed, uh, let's say in your program, or you were yeah. able to go and then the next year your bigs maybe aren't as good or your guards what you know you know you know for instance last year we couldn't shoot the ball at all, Matt. We were on the worst worst shooting teams. I should have brought you down here, right? And just uh, <laughs> go. You, you would have you would have, you would not have liked our you would have not have liked our team last year, man. Uh, but but. Um, you know, we, we couldn't shoot, but our guys played really, really hard. But we had to become one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country, right? If you're not going to make any shots. Yeah, get closer, get closer, get closer. Get, get closer to the rim <laughs> and we had to come off because that was the only way we could score, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, somebody asked me the other day, well, you know, are you guys going to continue to be a, one of the best rebounding teams? I said, well, I hope we're, oh, we are defensively, but offensively, I hope we make more shots. And we're, That's such a good point. You know, Not if we're shooting best, better. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be the best <laughs> offensive rebounding team in the country. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I think you, you're always a judge, right? We, uh, we're always, you're always stealing stuff as a college coach. I think, you know, from other people and what they're doing um, and what you like. And then at the same time, you have a core right there of values of what you believe in. Yeah. Yeah. You got you to break off and you got to adjust uh, according to your roster, right? And, 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 and your team and, 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 and what you have that year. I think that's the, the great place to be is where you're dealing more with concepts rather than a, a specific system that's rigid that you have that you're trying to force everybody into because I feel like concepts can change and 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 flow and they can also be like Chris Oliver with basketball immersion talked about musts versus possibilities yeah. like for some of your players they they have to pass and get out that's a must. Right. other players have the ability to maybe hand off and ball screen or fan away. You know, like so I, I think when you're dealing with, I don't know, maybe any level, but when when players are coming in and out, but you still have this way of playing that you just believe in. Because I feel like, Coach, you got to believe in what you're teaching them. It, because if it's a system you don't really believe in, I feel like they're going to feel that, they're going to know. Or when things get tough and you abandon it, then they'll really know. But with yeah. concepts, maybe you can have a different look. I don't know what you do if we had a really big guy. It's never happened in 11 years. <laughs> We we've 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 morphed some you know what our big would be six four six five slower guys we've made them guards but right. I don't know what we do with like a six nine kind of slow footed dude but if he demanded the ball in a way that like we will win more we'll score more with him doing that yeah I'd have to adjust some concepts yeah you you'd have to you know you have to and again you know it's our job is to put the ball in the basket right and you got to try to find the ways to win games and um. You know, so yeah, we, we we've made some adjustments to what we've done. Um, you know, um, you know, in the past, uh, we're trying some new things. Uh, you know, this year, what's the all the these new zooms and wiggles and waggles and uh, <laughs> so you know, many different. Starting to yeah, I'm becoming yeah. off of a genius right now. I've always That's... been in vanilla, right? But I'm starting to. Uh, I could get in the conversation now with Grant and Linda, right? I, I could be on the phone call with them. Sometimes but, uh, I feel like they're just making words up, like you know, just to sound like. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to zing this time. And then uh, we're going to like, what? Because you, and then you hear like five different people use different language for the same action. Right. So, coach, I think you and I, we just make up our own language and sound really smart. Yeah, we sound good. Like, yeah, I get on these deals now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're zooming and we're waggling, we're wiggling, and we're zinging. <laughs> yeah, he knows his stuff, but he studies European ball. But <laughs> that's right. Yeah, all you got to say is European ball. People go, oh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. He's really good. he knows his, he knows his <laughs> stuff, right? But, uh, so perfect scenario, though. Like you have the players that 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 just fit. Maybe it was what you had at ACU for a little while there, you know, when you're developing guys, like you said. And that's a good point, though, too, is whatever style you play, the development needs to mirror that, mimic that, lead to that success. 
what's your favorite offensive just way to play? Yeah, you know, we, we, we've um, we morphed when I was at Abilene Christian. We ran ball screen motion when I first got the job. Um, and then we ran motion uh, for for a couple years. Um, and I, I just didn't like motion, man. I just didn't feel like, uh, you know, I like the movement in motion. I really enjoyed coaching motion. Uh, I thought it was a lot of, lot of fun, uh, to, to coach it. Yeah. But, um, it, it, we just could never get the players there at Abilene Christian. And so people would just switch us or do things right. And then we couldn't win the one-on-one battles. Um, and so, uh, I, I got to where, um, coach Gillespie became a really, really good friend. Uh, he was the coach at Ranger junior college and I spent a lot of time with him. And he kept trying to convince me to go to two game, right? The, the old school Bill Self that, that Bill and him ran forever. And he just thought it, it would bring a little lot of discipline to, to our team. We wouldn't turn it over as much. We would understand where we were getting our shots. It would bring a toughness of physicality to us around the yeah. rim. Um, and then we could get creative around that, right? But you could always get back in transition. You were always a good re- rebounding team on both ends of the floor. There was a toughness. Of, it, it would match how we played defensively. And so we made that switch probably my fourth, I guess it might've been my first or second year that we were division one, right? Um, not, not the D two years, but um, we made that switch and it changed our program, right? Uh, wow. it, 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 it was really successful for us and our guys bought in. It kind of fit our culture because you have to cut and move a lot and, and you got to depend on other guys to cut and move. And you got to depend on bigs at times to be unselfish and uh, you know, to, steal their guy to create driving lanes and then the guards have to be unselfish obviously to throw the ball inside but we touch paint a lot right in the high low stuff and then you know man I'm not different than any other coach out there right like at the end of the day we're going to have our best players are going to have the ball in their hands and if that's a middle ball if that's a set that we're going to run right we'll we'll break off of it and and we'll um, but I like it man the ball moves you know uh, you know we usually have a tendency when our teams are really good offensively we'll have you know four to six guys in double figures right uh we don't necessarily have one guy that averages 25 right and everybody else averages four or five right yeah. uh, ball moves the, the it touches a lots of different hands in each possession and a lot of guys get to score right depending on you know two games come with those deals like if you want to guard us this way okay then these guys are probably going to score right and if you're going to guard it this way then these guys are going to have that night and so you have to be unselfish enough to understand that and how the defense is going to guard you and play you and so that's how we've played, right? I guess in the last six, seven years, um, eight years, and something that I believe in. But uh, again, um, we're also going to get the ball right into our best players' hands when we when we need baskets or if, if things aren't working. Um, and then we're trying to get creative, like I told you, right, in different ways that we can make two, two game better and yeah. uh, we can get some more of the zoom and the wiggle and, and create some more double gap things, personnel driven uh, for, for our mm-hmm. for our team uh, to 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 be more successful offensively. Coaches. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Bology. Manage and measure your player's skill development and increase accountability year-round utilizing the Bology app. Boost inter-squad competition with drills backed by the National High School Basketball Coaches Association, including a 40-shot Bology skills assessment. Please visit Bology.com slash teams for information on how you can provide this resource for your team. I love what you said about the not the struggles you had in motion, but just the fact that you love coaching it because there is this beauty to watching a lot of these actions stack on top of each other, you know, it kind of transports you back to uh, maybe Hoosiers or something, but we were at McKinney. Yeah. We're, we're my second year there with coach Watson. I mean, we put in, I had a Bobby Knight packet, you know, we're putting in his motion coach would have still relatively young. He'd have me jump in and kind of help in some things. And I just told him one time, I was like, coach, I'm, I'm seeing tons of good stuff here playing this. Like, this is great. But our players didn't see much. You know, it's like you talk about read and react. It couldn't read and we didn't react very well. And then and then I realized, like, a good question, I think, for any coach is what you're running. Is it creating advantages for your best playmakers? If it's just pretty action, that actually doesn't lead to anything. And when you've done eight things, you're back with a ball in somebody's hands that can't really do much with it. You got to be careful with that. And I think so many times we're, we're stuck in patterns. And then to your point too, the, what a great, I think a mark of a great continuity or idea of playing is whatever they choose defensively, they're wrong. Right. I think you're in good, you're in a good spot there. Well, that's right now. I believe, right. Like to your point, your players yeah. know, like, I believe in two game, right? Like I, yeah. I, I we won, you know, we won a lot of games with two games for five or six years in a row. And so, 
like I believe in it. I've seen it work, right? And then, and then to your point, you 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 start to understand the ins and outs of it, right? So if teams want to do this, you're prepared in front of your team to know what what you need to do, right? To 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 uh, you know to go against that. So uh, I, I think the biggest thing is I believe in it, right? And then when I believe in something, obviously I'm going to get the players. You know, they're going to feel that, and, and they're going to want to believe in it. And so, uh, but it, but it's two games. It, it's 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 fun to coach. It's fun when it's run right, right, and the ball's moving and guys are cutting and. Um, you know, the, the problem with two game, we have to get creative with how we do it is you have to keep them cutting now, right. From September to March. Right. So that's a, that's a long time. Right. So again, we, we always yeah. are getting creative on different ways that we can do other things. And, um, we also, you know, there's, there's days where we don't do as much, right. Offensive cutting because, uh, you, you, you got to cut and you got to move, right. You have to be unselfish on that. Um, because other pieces won't work for the part. Right. And so again, just being creative on different ways we're doing that. And then I think, uh, I, I always are trying to challenge myself. I've got to get better uh, at finding ways to get our best players the opportunities to score score the basketball. Um, to your point, whether that be in, in space, right? Everybody's in space. I, I tell you this, man. I know you did a podcast with him, but um, a, whenever it was a month or two, but you, you I, I listened to it with Dusty May, and I thought what Dusty May did did a great job of last year. This was really creative, and I, I'd never really seen this before. But he basically ran two different offenses, right? When the when the big kid w- was in the transfer from uh, wherever he was, Texas Tech, you know, they did a lot more, you know, ball screen and rolling him to the rim, right, and putting yeah. him in front of the rim. And then they had the undersized post that was like six six, and they did a lot of pinch post elbow stuff and Princeton actions with him, and so. It was almost like you had to, you know, you were preparing for two different. Yeah. Things. Um, and I thought that was really good uh, on part on his part, again, of, you know, to your point, adjusting, you know, his offense to fit his pieces. And I just never seen a guy do it, you know, like, like, like played against it where in the same. And, and they both work, you know, right, he's right. having success in both because that's a great point. Like almost like having two different teams you know two different like like really schemes or waves but the danger is uh, maybe for at the at the high school level is if like if you get too deep or you're trying to actually have two separate identities do they actually become good at either of them or are you a jack of all trades a master of none but to your point he he did do uh it was an amazing example of of having two almost two identities based on what the other team's personnel look like oh we got it let's get these guys in you know, or what he had in. That's a good point. Thanks for listening to that, by the way. That's pretty cool. No, I thought it was really good, man. You know, and, and, and um, you know, I, I thought it was just a good way. And everybody has a different, you know, when you have a guard, I think you can do it. You know, it's kind of like, like Andy Kendi had Jilly Walker, Grant had Perry, uh, you know, uh, Nick's had some really good guards at Middle West. Regard, uh, there's really good guards in Comfort USA, by the way, yeah. but. But, but when you have a guard, I think you don't. You can kind of still run the same stuff. You're just working on different actions and different things to, to get them in space to to create opportunities for them, or, or you know, obviously cause us to overhelp and, and and where those guys are spraying. But when you have bigs, that was that's the tricky part, right? Because you have one big that might be a low block player, and then to your point, one big that might be really good with the ball in his hands, and he can do the handoffs and the zoom acts, you know, and different and different things. And so, how do you morph? You know, you just are you hard headed and say, no, we're going to do this. You're going to play on the low yeah. block. A low block, um, you know, but but or, or do you morph those two in? And I thought Dusty did a great job, you know, um, with that. You would like to think in recruiting, saying, "Hey, this is the way we're going to play, and we're gonna, all of our guys are." But but to your point earlier, you might not be able to get that right, and so yeah. you don't have that in recruiting, and, and you just find different ways to again uh, make your personnel work the best it, it, it can. And to go back to something you said earlier about development, when you do focus on development throughout your year, guys are going to get better. Guys are going to surprise you, and you'll start to see. Golly, I know, like for us, we have a six-five guy that if you'd have told me three years ago that I'd be okay with him bringing the ball up the floor and initiating some of our actions, like again, Coach Six-five for us is the equivalent to like a six-nine, six-ten at a public school. You know, he's huge here, and but skill development, I've just seen and in small-sided games, I've seen him do amazing things. If I'm rigid in what I'm thinking, even though or we don't focus on development like you do, we might not see the improvement or maybe an area, a wrinkle that we could throw in, a zing that we could throw in that unlocks something great that that player can do. 
Yeah. And again, I relate to, to baseball, you know, with our guys too, like you can throw fastballs all night, right? You got to locate your fastball uh, and you got to be really good. If you don't have a good fastball, you can't pitch. Right. But at the same time, you can't go through the batting order the second or third time, just throwing fastballs right? all the time. Right. Eventually they're going to catch up to speed and they're going to understand it. And you better have a curveball, And then sometimes you better have a slider, right. Or a change up. And so uh, that's kind of how we think about our offense, right. Our fastball is two game, right. It's going to something that's our base. It's what we're going to be really good at. And um, if teams, you know, if if we're if we get in the game and in and the fastball, they start to hit the fastball, uh, or they're adjusting on it. We have to have curveballs, right? And we have to have something else we can throw at them um, to to adjust, not just on what they're doing defensively, right? But it might be something that we're trying to to to, to do. Um, we don't ever overhaul. I did that one time, young in my career, um, and I got advice for any coaches out there to to learn from my mistake is. If you're ever going to do, do something completely different than what you've been working on, uh -huh. you better make darn sure you pick the right time in the season to do it where yeah. you can have success, right? Because if you make that change, and, and you know, and sometimes you have to make that, right? Sometimes if you believe if you're a pressure team and you got to go to gaps or you're a gaps and you think you're better at for whatever, and if you make that change, you better have success immediately with that. You better pick choose your time to do it because if you don't, now they think you've hit the panic button, right? And now it's it's over. Now you're not even, and you're not getting them back going the other way either. And so then you got a mess on your hands. So um, that would be my advice, <laughs> coach. That that's such great advice, and and you're right on the money to piggyback off of that. That same story with the the motion and the Bobby Knight stuff. The reason we went to that is because we had put dribble drive in. You know, the Calipari packet came around back in the Memphis days. You know, and he, and he, I told coach, I really like this for, and especially maybe another uh, uh, alarm or thing to be careful of is designing an offensive scheme or system on one player. Like, because he got busted at a party, lost him for half the season. We abandoned dribble drive. It probably would not have looked as good without him because we thought he was a catalyst for getting the wheel going but you know what i mean we should have stayed sold out we were eight and 21 that year scouting our butts off against oh, yeah. craft and all those dudes you know who out scouts everyone but coach we did that we 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 in one day after that happened threw it all away never felt like we got the confidence of our guys back and for their development sticking and dribble drive would have been better been better for him yeah yeah no i just i did it at Adlin christian and i i learned a big lesson and uh, you know again there's times to there's times i can you know we've done it here and there, i remember going back was it brad underwood at oklahoma state you know he he pressured that i think it was his first year maybe at oklahoma state right he really pressured and but they were just getting beat you know too much they weren't able to rotate and i don't know he might have had some injury I, I don't know the situation but they went to gaps like halfway through the big 12 and he ends up making the ncaa tournament you know so like th there's there's time there's times to do it um it's just uh, you you got to pick and choose to your point, and, and you but adjustments be, versus overhaul. That, that's completely different, right? I think yeah. you're always making adjustments, right? Yeah. Like these coaches are too good at your level; <laughs> they're too good at, at our level. There's so much film out there now. Like yeah. you're you're constantly, you know, like if we have diamond in Matt, by the end of the year, we're going to have ten diamonds, right? Like like you know, <laughs> what I mean? like you're always trying to say, okay, you know, they know this is coming, but this yeah. is the counter, and we try to do that if, if any things that we put in, right? Or and, and we, you know, as many years as we've done it now, we have we have the counters, right? But the, when you're putting new things in, I always challenge our staff on the offensive side of the ball. Okay, we're going to put in a zinc, for instance. Um, but 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 Coach, if, we've started something here. I'm yeah. going to get emails. Hey, can you tell me again what the zing action is, Coach? I don't know. I, I that's Matt and that's Matt and Joe's deal, and, and we'll, we'll do a coaching clinic on it this summer. It's going to be like Will Ferrell and semi pro. It's when you run around in a circle going rover, and then that's it. <laughs> zinc, brother. But I, I tell yeah. them. Uh, I tell them. Like, what's the counter to it, right? You better have two or three counters, right? We can yeah. put it in and work the first night, right? But then they're going to scout us, and so then they're going to take start taking that away or know what's coming. So what's the counter? What's the counter to it, you know? And so I think that's that's some really good advice. The other thing I, I think I've learned um, throughout the years, to your point earlier about back to motion and how great it looked like, uh, just the simpler I get, uh, the better my teams are, right? Like, and, and I try to – when I first got into coaching, um, whether it was at Saxe, whether it was at Abilene Christian, I, I tried to be Johnny Ball coach, right? I wanted to coach everything. I had 150 sets. I look like an NFL offensive coordinator over there with yeah, my sheet. <laughs> uh, 
and and, and we were always trying to to do di different things and and just you talk about over coaching i apologize to those players all the time right and then when, when we started just simplifying and saying hey listen like we're going to be really 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 good at this right and i don't care if you know what we are right like I, at this point in time, people know we hard hedge ball screens, right? <laughs> like it's, it's, it's well known. It's out there. It's what, it's what we, it's what we do. And and people can prepare for that, but we're going to get really, really good at it. Right. Yeah. And now to your point, we have to make some adjustments throughout the year. And there's times you don't hard hedge, right? There might be a time you switch the ball screen or um, you get my point, right? But, yes, but, but we're gonna yeah. keep it simple on both ends of the floor and we're going to get really good at it. And when we started doing that, man, it was amazing how much better our teams, our teams were. I think that's a, a great drill or activity for coaches to do. Just go through your playbook on both both and both sides and just try to cut 25%. Like see see how much you can take off, how much fluff, how many actions that are outliers that are unlike other things. Cause it's really nice when you can have a few of your concepts that you can repeat just in multiple spots. So you're not necessarily teaching something new. But it, it is a different look and it gives the defense a different look just with moving them or making having bodies stand in different spots. But that's a great point, coach. Yeah, no. And I, I think to your point also right there, I think you if you're going to if you're going to keep it simple, too, which I, I believe in, you got to find different ways to be creative to keep it yeah. simple. That makes yeah. sense, right. You can't keep doing the same stuff for six months. They're going to get tired of it. Right. Like you got to find different drills and different ways to 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 better your, you know, your, your simplicity if that makes any sense, but it but, does. Uh, yeah. You know, and it can work on both sides of the ball. And, but uh, yeah, I overcoached. I, it was, I, I look back now and laugh at myself. Right. But I just think we all want to coach so much and we want to, to your point, we want it to look pretty. We, we want it to look like we've done a good job coaching, but there's a, you know, there's another side of that too, where you overcoach and, and then you're just average. You're not very good at a lot of different things, man. And uh, you're not going to win a lot of games. You're right on the money. Rarely are we under coaching. Like that's, that's not the side of it. <laughs> Yeah. That's not that's not the side of the spectrum that majority of us err on, right. but it's it's just getting too complex when uh you know kiss keep it simple right like like that's that needs to be the goal. But I appreciate you sharing that. I I don't know about you, um, but it is hard not to compare yourself to other coaches. And when you see someone at a clinic, or you hear somebody talk, or you get a packet or an email with the 33 ways to do this. And I'm like, golly, 33. Like, I, I'm not very good at one or two. It, but the, the truth is, is have the self-awareness to know within your bandwidth, within what your team actually can do. Like, what are the what are the achievements that we can make and not compare yourself to the others? Yeah, no question. And I, I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but there's there's guys that out there that that they win in they win in that philosophy on social media or a coaching clinic because all that sounds really, really good in theory, right? Like on social media, that thing will blow up and this is what your clinic you come out of, they're like, wow, that was a great job. You did a great job speaking. That's 33. It's kind of like when I was uh, getting my education degree, Matt, at Avalon Christian, right? They give you all these great ways to teach and how you're going to, you know, and then all of a sudden you get in the room and the, <laughs> the classroom, this is your 32 students. You <laughs> That don't work. You know? Hold on, hold on, guys. I'm not to level eight yet. yet. I'm, I'm <laughs> only at level two of my of my plan. Here, the education didn't mean anything. Throw that in the trash and here we go, right? Well, I, so again, I'm not saying it's wrong, but like all that stuff for social, in my opinion, there's a lot of people out there that say a lot of great things on social media and, and clinics, but that ain't the reality of it, right? Like the, uh, the reality, the reality is, man, you got to get a team to like, like, for instance, back to that point, like if you'd have come to watch this practice, having Christian those days and in our, let's say pregame shoot around, you'd have been really impressed. Like, man, those guys are running like 45, 50 sets on both sides of the floor. They all know what they're doing. They're they're you know, but then you watch us play and, 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 out of the 50 sets, 45 of them didn't work or we, you know what I mean? We didn't run them right. And so really yeah. our, our shoot around looked great, but we didn't win any games. So yeah. um, again, I just think simpler is the best. Simplicity is the best, um, you know, and so I might be born in a clinic, right. Um, but, but at the same time, I, I think I, I've been fortunate to be around some really good coaches in my career. I've also listened and learned from good coaches and I know how they win. You know, they don't overcomplicate things. They let players go make plays. They, they just, they believe in certain things, core values, uh, they make sure, you know, I would hope to think, Matt, if you came in our locker room and said, hey, what are your what do you guys believe in on the defense? They know that they, they know our two or three non-negotiables. They know yeah. our two or three non-negotiables on the offensive side of the ball. That's what we believe in. And uh, that's when we've had our good teams. Right. 
man, that clarity is really important. And I was, I was sitting here kind of listening to you of, of what would be the advice be like it for, for a new coach or a coach that maybe is you know, like many of us, just, you have a huge list of things that you're trying to achieve. Like what are those things that you just, you can't fail at, or you got to be really good at focused on like one is, you do have to fight for your culture every day. As as corny as that sounds like, you got to have, you have one, it's got to be positive and you got to be fighting for it every day. So that like, take that off the board. Like that's a number one job. Then have a simple st- uh, system, have a simple system on offense and defense that players can know, get deep into, get better at, and then develop them. The skill development on both sides of the floor. Like, I think you focus on those three areas. I don't care what level you're at. You're not getting worse. No, no, you're going to win more games. You know, and there's times that talent's going to get you, right? No doubt. It it happens. You see it when you go play play some public schools for whatever. You know what I mean? There might be times at private school where you're – I I don't know what the high school landscape looks like. You said you guys aren't recruiting. I I feel like everybody's recruiting now. But, yeah, you know, but, 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 yeah, I think you're 100% correct. And if you just spend time on those three things, right, and then the players know that, and then you're all on the same page. I mean, that's coaching, Matt, right? Like coaching is getting guys to believe in in in, in each other, in you, and and coaching is getting guys beliefs, uh, but 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 belief on both sides of the floor that what you're doing and, and doing it together, right? That that's coaching. And there's you have to coach different kids different ways to get them there. Yeah. Um, you have to build different relationships with different kids to get them there. Um, and some kids get there faster than others, um, which is why, you know, some years you play seven guys, some years you're playing 10 guys. Uh, it, it's just, that's coaching. Right. And, and I just think the more we complicate it, uh, the more we try to make it not necessarily about ourselves, but I just, there's different ways to overcoach, right? You panic, you don't think you're good enough or that, you know, things aren't working or you're going a two game losing streak or three game. And so the pressure's building and people on the outside world are thinking you should be doing this or that. But, you know, I always say it, it, between the walls, we know, right. And it, we, if we believe in what we believe in and we're all on the page and we work on our craft each and every day together, um, we're going to win games. Right. Uh, and you're going to have adversity. Things are going to, things are going to happen. I mean, that's, that's the reality of athletics. That's why we all got in it. Uh, because it taught us life skills, uh, because life's not going to be rosy and peachy. There's going to be things that happen in our life. Um, the adversity is coming. But if we believe in, in in core values, we believe in core things and we work on them each and every day. Uh, you know, we have another saying in our program, trust the process, which is basically that. Right. Like just we don't ever talk about man. I got a first kind of coaching. We're going to win 25 games. We're going to the NCAA tournament. We're uh, or high school. Right. We're going to be we're going to be, you know, McKinney North eight times or, or we're going to split five <laughs> times out of the 10 times we play them or, uh, you know, but now we don't, man. We just trust yeah. the process each day. I try to get better as a coach. My staff tries to get better as a staff. Our players are trying to get better each day. We're trusting the process. And if we do that in March, we're going to look up and we're going to be in a situation that we want to be in. Right. Um, we're going to have the 20 wins. We're going to be in a situation to go to the NCAA tournament, you know? And so we really try to simplify to that, even that, right. Like just quit, Quit worrying about all the other stuff. Just just trust the process each and every day. And everybody's process is different, right? Everybody's journeys, to your point, in development is different. But if you trust your process, you trust your journey, you're going to put yourself in a situation, you know. So there's no panic, right, within the year. And um, you just you continue to try to get better. So um, that's kind of how we do it. I don't know. Yeah, everybody does it differently, right? Uh, and, and that's okay, right? That's the beauty of coaching, Yeah, I think, right? Like everybody has different things they believe in and different ways of, of doing it. And, and that's that's what's fun about coaching. Coach, there's a lot of gold there. And I recently had a talk or, or put this episode out with a, a lady named Shawnee Harley. And it, no, I didn't know her before um, Tyler Costin connected us to each other. She was one of the uh, Canadian Olympic women on the women's side, one of their coaches for eight years, a coach, college coach for 20 years. It's it's one of the most impactful talks I've been able to have as far as like I needed to hear that. And the one thing she really focused on was as coaches, us being aware of when we make fear based decisions and the fear is us being afraid of losing. Because that fear, I mean, coach, the pressure at your level, it's 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 insane. It's very different for me here. I know at faith, if I'm discipling them the right way, you know, treating them the right way, and, and we have a good plan and we're competitive, I could be 500. 
you know, and I'm still going to have a job. Not every high school job is like that. Golly, you're at Allen High School. Like, you better win. You got 7,000 kids. It's it's like a college. You bet. But my whole point is, and when I am making decisions based off of the fear of losing, like those are the decisions that you look back and you regret. You're you're making an abrupt change because you're you're a knee jerk reaction to something. You're you're not worried about culture because you have to worry about this because this. Le- so instead of she just says instead of the fear of 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 losing, you know, uh, eliminate that. Understand that it's going to happen, and it's all about process. You're right on the money, but that shift for me, like the way she said that and communicated, is like yeah, my worst decisions I've made of a coach we're all fear-based and not, not out of courage. And I think that's the hardest thing. One or some of the hardest things in coaching, Matt, right. Is that it's like when you're on a losing streak, do you truly believe in what you're doing? Right. Uh, and then it could go back to what you and I talked about earlier. Maybe we can make some adjust. It might be time to make some adjustments. Maybe not, it's not overhaul. Right. But maybe yeah. make some um, adjustments to it, you know, but I think that's really difficult, right. It's hard to do. And the pressure mounts, the, the, you know, there's, there's pressure in all coaching, right? Like I, you know, like uh, we're all whether you're a junior high coach, you get your pressure by the parents, right? There's crazy yeah. parents out there, yeah. uh, you know, or whatever. But there's always pressure, and you got to believe. You got you got to believe in yourself. Uh, you got to believe in what you're doing because when you do make those fear based decisions, you know, and I, I think the second hardest thing to do is accountability, right? Like it's just you know when it's your best players, you know, when when, when you're fortunate to coach. When your best players are your hardest workers, yeah. those, are the, those are fun to coach, right? Like, and we've all had them, uh, and, and they're a lot of fun to be around. It's, it's a it's a fun year, right? But when your best players aren't necessarily your hardest workers, then you got to figure it out a little bit, right? And then what's the accountability piece? Uh, you know, and I think in today's where we were talking with our staff this summer that, you know, you can't just put them on the track at four or five o'clock in the morning and run, you know, just go run, run. I mean, you know, like that doesn't work anymore. Remember right? the Titans, that, yes, yeah, that yeah. culture does not work. What's the Urban Meyer deal that was uh, that, that Ooh, came out? Oh, the swamp. Right? So, yeah, yeah. Like you can't do that anymore. Obviously, right. Our like, goal is to run people off. No, 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 no. Like that, that's not it, Coach. <laughs> right. Like I, I wish I, I told my, my staff or my wife, whatever it was, like I wish I could have played for him during the one just to see if I was tough enough to make it. Yeah. It's like it's like the Navy SEAL, like going through buds. Like I don't think I could do it, but man, what if I could? But <laughs> could I have done it for one year? Was I mentally tough enough to do it? Right. Like it's always always challenged myself. Right. Like, but. Again, you can't do it. So how do you hold guys accountable? Now, the biggest we think, or I, I believe here, that it's it's through depth, right? Like if, if the better depth we can get, the, the more guys that we can get to, to play, the easier it is to hold guys accountable. Yeah. Right? Um, that, that have it. And so, uh, but but that's the hardest, right? As a young coach, uh, you know, I'm more comfortable now a little bit, I hope, in my skin to, to know when you have to make tough decisions and, and you have to do some things. But um, you know, I think that's the when you were young, you're like, well, he's our best player. I can't, I can't, I can't yeah. touch him. I can't, him. I can't do anything. And then, you know, you realize when you, sometimes when you eliminate that, you become better. Sometimes there's ways to, when you hold him accountable, he becomes better. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, 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 the, it's the process. Sometimes, sometimes you don't, sometimes you lose that kid and you don't, you, 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 you're not better. Right. And, and so is it, you know, again, that, that's the, in coaching that's tough. I think. Yeah. And, and I think then at that point when like, let's just say you lose the best player, well, then you have to define success differently at that point. Like like Coach Drew, my senior year, we had six scholarship players. We we're eight and 21. We were really successful. We just had to define it differently. When you lose that best player, the success might be in actually the culture of your locker room and the belief in your team and that the future will benefit from that hard decision that you made. But you're right on the money difficult in that spot most of the time you get to look back at that and realize years later i messed up or i did it right yeah yeah it, it doesn't usually know right you don't write no right then usually um yeah down the road you're saying yes i hit that the right way you know i made the right decision or no and i got some regret but that's right? a part of it that's a part of the journey right yeah and I also think, Matt, there's tough decisions every year that you have to make. And, um, you know, sometimes you make the right one, you know, and sometimes you don't, you know, you're, you're constantly making so like everybody thinks, Oh man, that they, they coach, man. I, no, I, I, the longer I'm in this, this, yes, we're coaching, right? Yes. I, I love the time on the practice floor, but there's so much other stuff now that we have to do yeah. that, that not coaching. Right. Um, and so that's where the business. What percent, what would, what, what percent would you say is I, actually you on the floor? Five, five, ten percent. With coaching, yeah, like act, like actually being on the floor with them, with all the responsibilities, yeah, all the things you have say, to do. Higher than twenty percent, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's probably more like to your point, five or ten. You know, it's just, 
uh, and, and that's why we got into it, right? You and I got into it for the coaching and the relationship and being around kids and developing kids and hopefully, you know, that they're successful in their lives. And the and, love and for that is still enough, right? Yeah. And you can still do that. Absolutely. Right. But, yeah. but, the, but the challenge is just, there's so much more that whether it's, there's so many more meetings now, right? I have compliance yeah. meetings, staff meetings. So many more podcasts, annoying people asking well, you to do podcast, stuff. And... <laughs> but, you know what I mean? And then, and then, no. and then just the, the mental health piece of it. Yeah. Now, that's yeah. So big. And just, then again, the relation building relationship just uh, uh, it's just you think you're having a great day, right? You're like you're like I'm always I'm always like, and then you check your email and yeah, and now you're, right, and then you're now you're this. Oh. on your phone and you're like, uh, so yeah, it's just and I think how you manage those situations though determines a lot too of how good your team's going to be on the floor. And again, back to the culture piece. But when you're not having to manage all those problems and you're not having to deal with a lot of that other stuff, your teams tend to be more successful, right? When they're protecting that. So, um, you know, I think it goes hand in hand. Coaches, we are all searching for ways to better evaluate players in order to give meaningful feedback. Over 15 years ago, I put together a test called the Jamoti Skill Rating. The JSR takes players through a series of tests involving basketball skill or athleticism, giving them one rating at the end. Their JSR rating will give you clarity on what needs to be discussed with players and parents on areas they need to focus on improving. I test our players at least four times each year. They're able to compete against each other, pass player scores, and most importantly, their past performances. If you'd like to start testing your athletes, email me at jamotipodcast at gmail.com for more information. Coach, the speed round. I'll, quick questions here and then I'll get you out. Sound good? Okay. Yeah. First thing that pops in your head? Blurted out. Uh, favorite ice cream flavor? Mint chocolate chip. Coach, the same. Mint chocolate now, chip. You, and then what, I, was the sigh like you're reluctant to say it? That's a good flavor, Coach. It's a yeah. No, I I like it. But I've, lately, I've been a, I've been a, 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 the problem. There's a Baskin Robbins, Matt, right across the street. Real quick, you got there. 31 flavors. Yeah, there you there go. You so I get a little, you know, a little confused sometimes. But mint chocolate <laughs> chip is my go-to. Yeah. <laughs> Greatest shooter of all time. Uh, coach Peyton Ricks. Uh, that's that's a great great. Peyton Ricks was a really good player, self made player. Wow. We said love, love basketball, but could really 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 shoot the basketball uh, for us at Abilene Christian. Outside of it, all time. Outside of it, all time. Curry. Yeah. Your best. I like to say Larry Bird, but Curry. Curry. Yeah, this, Larry's awesome, no doubt. But man, uh, best basketball movie of all time. Hoosiers. Texting or talking? Te texting. <laughs> Unfortunately. I think that's the truth. Yeah. Like I. I mean, yeah, I wish I talked more, you know, but like, it's just, I had that this morning, even with my wife, Matt, like uh, I, I wanted her to do something for me and I could have picked up the phone and I, then we started texting and, th and then it got too long. So then I picked up the phone. I should have just picked up the phone. Right. Uh, yeah. But you can text 60 people in a day. I don't think you can have 60 conversations in a day. You know, like on the phone and the convenience. I don't like email. I'm not an email guy. I can't yeah. stand email. Um, <laughs> when I was at Abilene Christian, it was great. We never email private. So I don't know. State schools, state schools email all the time, right? That's what they do. <laughs> uh, it's it's email, but I'd rather just text. Yeah. All right. Being in Texas for high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Ooh. I, I, do, I do think the shot clock needs to happen. Um, I think it helps players prepare for the next now okay easy argument all those guys are going to play at the next level right like i get that but i do yeah. think i think these kids are seeing it more and more they're doing it a little bit more on the aau now you know they're doing they're, they're, they're seeing it and i think a lot of states some states are, are, are but i i do I, my foot on the other side of it if if when i was at Saxe and we didn't have good enough players like like for instance out here uh we have really good coaches in el paso matt high school coaching out here in el paso is terrific uh, you know, these guys, you know, they don't necessarily have the the talent that the Metroplex has. Yeah. Um, but coaching is terrific. And then so, you know, for instance, if you're a six, a school here and you got to go play Duncanville or you got to go play DeSoto, um, you know, Matt, I, I do get that side of it. Right. Like if we had a shot clock out here, uh, you know, it, it, more possessions in a game, uh, they're not going to have, you know, a chance to make, maybe compete. And it gives them a chance to compete because, Different than college where you can go recruit, you know, and get players. They can't, right? They can't recruit. That's a great they point. What they have and they to make it competitive, not having a shot clock helps them, right? So I, I do see both both sides of it. I'm glad I don't have to make that decision. I'm not I, I, I 
I do see both sides. I sound like a damn politician now, right? Like, <laughs> Coach, stand for something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I think if you're right on the money. Or, or, or oh. Right? Yeah. yeah. 24 seconds. Let's go. Cause we've got the best horses. You're right. If I'm coaching here, uh, I, I don't want one. So. Yep. Uh, favorite holiday? Christmas. Because I get two days off, right? We don't get Thanksgiving off, unfortunately. Yeah. You know? Up three on defense, seven seconds left. Do you foul or no foul? We're going to have that talk in a week, right? So we, we change it every year <laughs> uh, based on uh, – but if a full court situation and something like that, we would foul as close to half court as we could and hopefully have it at that point in time at like three or four seconds, yeah. right? Uh, we wouldn't probably foul right away when the ball – you know, at seven, we'd try to let them take two dribbles, uh, you know, try to get to half court, and we would probably, we would foul, yes. Yeah. What book would you give someone? Ooh. Uh, I'm reading Play the Man right now by Mark Batterson. Have you read okay. that? No, but I've heard a lot of coaches have said well, that. You ought, you ought to read that. That's my reading right now. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll recommend that today, right? Nice. So I, there you go. Uh, I think it's a good book. Two more. Name a bucket list item you still need to do. Mm, bucket list item. Uh, make the NCAA tournament at UTEP. You know, I mean, I think that's what, you know, I, I've spent 20 years of my life, Matt, you know, at Abilene Christian. Um, yeah. And so it was a big, big decision for my family, myself, my kids to, to make this move here. And, uh, you know, I would like to to get, you know, this is a proud program. It's got a lot of history and tradition. Some great um, players have come out of there. Yeah. There's pros, NBA yeah. Hall of Famers have played here at UTEP. And, uh, you know, my bucket list would, would get these fans to experience that. Uh, you know, they haven't experienced it in 12 years. Right. And they're, and they're really, uh, they're, they're not used to that. Right. So yeah. just to get this program, but that would be a bucket list. You know, people don't realize how hard at this level uh, it is to make the NSA tournament, you know, and uh, it, it's just, you know, uh, Chris Jans is a really good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we talk and one of the things he said that the reason he took the Mississippi state job was, you know, in the whack, there was so much pressure for him to go, but only one team was, was going to go. Right. And people yeah. don't understand one big league, how difficult, it is, you know, and we were very fortunate at ACU to go twice and you feel like it's going to happen. It doesn't. It's it's really, really, really hard to do. And, you know, like Jans at Mississippi State now where eight or nine teams in the SEC are going to go. Right. Like it's that that's the beauty of being in the power fives. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it just makes it difficult here. But um, maybe a bucket list, you know, right now would, would be would be that, you know, just to see these guys, not only our team, you know, and our staff, but just the fans here. We, we have an incredible fan base. Uh, here in UTEP, and, and to see them experience that would be pretty cool. Love that. Last one in basketball, who is the goat? In basketball, who as far as playing? Oof. I was a Larry Bird fan. Yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up with Larry Bird, the Magic Johnson. I love Matt. I love how Magic played. Uh, and when I grew up in college, just might make some people mad. I was a Bobby Hurley fan. Uh, you know, I love me too. Too. yeah. I was a point guard. I wanted to play like Bob. You know, I, I enjoyed how he played, how he competed. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was going to Duke. Unfortunately, they never, <laughs> never got a letter from Coach K. Uh, and I've never played against her. I've always, I, I need to, I've always tried to want to play, you know, just. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he was probably my all time favorite, uh, f- favorite, favorite college player. Coach, Coach Wo- he- Wojo was mine uh, yes, because yes. he was right after him. And I, I always saw like, okay, if he can do it, like I can do it because he's, he's 98% effort and heart. You know, not a great shooter, decent handle, but just gave it all. So my high school coach, uh, I, I played, you know, Darren uh, Williams and Bracey Wright were sophomores when I was a senior. So Wojo calls our our locker room, you know, Coach T to talk to them about them. But I was a senior. He's like, hey, I got a player here that loves you, loves Duke. I used to go to Duke basketball camp when I was young and always wanted to be a, a Dukey. And, and so uh, – I get on the phone with Coach Wojo. He's like, "Yeah, hey Matt, what anything you got? What? Are you, so how do you get your feet quicker, Coach? How do you, I, I want? I was slow footed. How do I get jump rope every day?" I said, "Yes, sir." And so I just started jump rope. But that was the closest I got to Duke right there. You know, it's funny, Coach Boykins, one of our assistants on our staff. You know, played in the NBA for a long time, and and uh, oh wow, yeah, played in Eastern Michigan, and uh, I think Earl, he'll tell you, he's five ten. He's really about five six, right? But uh, but and always said like, what, 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 how do you, his feet were incredible, right? But like, what did you do? And he he jump rope, 
he was a boxer early on and his dad let him, you know, his dad um, ran a boxing ring for troubled kids in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, he would get guys off, was, uh, uh, off the streets, right? And, and that's how they did. They would teach him discipline in boxing and stuff like yeah. that. And Earl got in there, but again, they would jump rope all the time. And so when Earl does development with our guys in the spring and summer, they always, they jump rope, you know, for three, for three minutes. Um, you know, he's a big believer um, in that. But yeah, I, I liked Wojo too. Like I was a Bobby Hurley. I was a Duke fan. Uh, I'm on that side of it, man. Say what you want, man. It is what it is. But I, we got that going for us, man. We got the Duke and we got the Zing in, man, right? Yeah, so but did we actually get the answer to the who's the GOAT? Did you actually answer it? I think we yeah. went off on tangents. Well, I'm going to throw you really for a loop and say, Kobe, you know, I, I do I, – I love Kobe, man. So, like, I, I read I read the book. Like, I, I love learning about him now. I wish I'd have yeah. known more about him while he was, he was, he was here with us. I saw just an incredible deal with him the other day on a podcast with Nick Saban. And I don't know when it was done or if you've seen it, but he talks about, you know, I didn't know this. Like he didn't start his first two years in the NBA. You know, and he said the easy thing would have been to do was to listen to the outside people telling him he should be starting. He should be doing this. Yeah. Uh, and he did, man. He, he went, he went every day. The coach said, how, how do I get on the floor? How, how, what do I have to work? And he just went to work, right? He had his bubble. He went in with the people he trusted and bought all in, you know, with the coaching staff there and just worked, right? Worked on his deficiencies, worked on what he had to do. And then he said when he got to start, there was nowhere and you were never going to take it from him, right? Like once it was his. But I just thought it was so good, you know, in today's world with social media, uh, the radio, the the message boards, the page, just yeah. there's so many people coming at these guys. So today. many voices, man. Yeah. So many voices in their head that if you could just say, hey, I, I – I'm cutting out, you know, who, who's my inner circle that I really, really trust. And I'm going to just work, you know, to your point, like this, just, just go to work, put my head down, be loyal to something. And eventually if I put in the work, which I mean, Kobe's, when you read about it, the stuff, I mean, the stories, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I just, I loved him as a player, you know, growing up kind of my call. I just, I, I really liked him as a player and how he competed and won yeah. championships. And I thought he played on both sides of the floor, uh, you know, like, like my, my kids love Luca, right? Like, and I'm, I'm not a big, you know, because you there's know, some just, brilliance, there's funny. some brilliance that, to him. Yeah. Right? Luca skilled. Yes. Will he grow out of that? I hope so. Yeah. Because I'm a bit of a Maverick fan. Right. And so, yeah, I want to just, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but studying now, like Kobe was my, my favorite player and, and getting to learn more about him now. Um, I, I think, I think, that's where I'd go. Yeah. Coach, Round, again, I'm a politician. Look at me. I can't yeah, it. no. Coach, this was so enjoyable. First, I want to celebrate you on just your authenticity. Like, I thought you brought up a lot of points and made some comments on, on things that we all feel as coaches, but I don't think are talked about that often, you know, and, and I, I really appreciate you doing that. And then and giving up your time with how, how much you got going on, man. This was – I was honored by this. Thank you. Oh, you got it, man. Thank you. Thank you for the what you're doing. I know you're a heck of a coach, man. And uh, I like your story, man. Your story's pretty cool at Baylor, man. You know, so appreciate all you do, man. Tell, tell Coach Kraft and Wes I say hello, man, when you see him. I will. Man. Thank so you, far. Coach. Marshall's a good buddy, too, man. So tell, tell those guys to say hello, man. I will. All right, Matt. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.